welcome to a brand new episode of the Geek Buddies. <gasps> hey! Yeah. We are back at it on a Friday today. Uh, uh, Sans, uh, one of our members who is still in Tokyo having fun there in Disneyland in the Tinkerbell suite with Brian Leonard, uh, apparently from some of the pictures I saw. But we are wearing matching PJs. <laughs> match- I don't know how you even get that to happen. Uh, maybe <laughs> Michael will post that. Uh, Michael Vogel will post that on his uh, social media so you all can enjoy the glory of that. Or maybe I'll post it with his permission on my social media because it's an incredible photo. But anyway. Uh, the two of us are going to hold down the fort today with a lot of things that are going on in the world of geekdom. We're going to talk about uh, Craig Gillespie. We're going to talk about Ju- uh, Julia Garner. We're going to talk about these new trailers that dropped this week. And we're going to do a, uh, a recap of WonderCon because Shannon, our uh, uh, one of the hosts here on Geek Buddies, was there this weekend with uh, our brother of the Geek Buddies, uh, Mike Kalinowski. So we're going to jump into all of that here in this brand new episode of the Geek Buddies. But first, let's introduce ourselves. I am the outlaw John Roca, writer, producer, and host here on the Geek Buddies and the Outlaw Nation. And this is Shannon McClung. I'm an animation writer and a television actor where you can see some of our current work every weekend right now. On YouTube with the third season of Strawberry Shortcake, Barry in the Big City, you can see seasons one and two on Netflix. And yeah. there are the 45-minute uh, seasonal specials. And I, yeah, I think the spring one just came out. Wow. Um, so there's one more to go. But uh, But yeah, those are all on Netflix right now. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. And for those of you, some of you wondering, I'm wearing a Macho Man shirt. You know why? Because it's WrestleMania weekend, and I'm getting ready for it. But you know, we're here to talk about geek stuff. So I'm gonna calm it yeah. down. Talk about geek stuff. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> WrestleMania. All right, let's get into the first story here, Shannon. Since we have a limited amount of time today, and that is Craig Gillespie. Craig Gillespie is in talks. Has not officially signed. He's just in talks right now uh, to direct Supergirl for Warner Brothers and DC Studios. Of course, he directed Cruella, which was I thought was a really good film with uh, a two-time Oscar winner Emma Stone. I Tonya, which I think really took Margot Robbie to the next level as an actress, and led to Allison Janney getting her Oscar for Best Supporting Actress as well he's been involved in a number of things here been written a number of scripts and been involved in a number of projects here that are very um have a long history with female led uh um projects like even recently hulu's pam and tommy that breakdown of the relationship between pam anderson and tommy uh they're from uh tommy Lee jones they're from uh, motley Crue. so uh shannon your thoughts when you hear about this are you excited about craig gillespie do you like the choice uh, him and Millie Alcock coming together. I think it's an Aussie, Aussie connection. Oi, oi, oi. So what are your thoughts here on this? I mean, in terms of a sophomore directing announcement for DC, you know, with the first one being James Gunn, who is, yeah. you know, one of the one of the co-architects of the cinematic universe that's being presented. Craig Gillespie, man, that's an exciting, that's an exciting choice. I yeah. mean, again, coming off I, Tanya, coming off Cruella, um, yeah, th- like when, when I saw that headline, I think it was at WonderCon when mm-hmm. it was announced, I was like, man, that is, that's an awesome choice. I mean, again, yeah. this guy, at least just with his last two films, um, has a history of, you know, really, really dynamic, uh, female protagonists. Um, so I, I was curious, I mean, from, from of our, some, uh, from some of our female audience, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if that was, I, I'm curious what the thought is there because mm-hmm. again, this being a, a female led superhero film, um, plenty of great female directors out there. Yeah. I mean, Craig Gillespie to me, I'm like, man, that's a great choice, but I'd be really curious to hear like, did you, did you want a woman, but you know, behind the camera on this one? And I, and, and if, and if that was the opinion, I certainly get it. Right. Um, but at the same time, in terms of who they picked for this, Craig Gillespie, that's an awesome, awesome choice. And I, I think that yeah. kind of gives us a gives us an idea of where the project is going, despite the fact that it's going to be based off of uh, Tom King's run. Yeah. And look, I like him as a director, as you as you said. I mean, I, I mentioned a couple of things, but I liked Dumb Money last year. I really enjoyed uh, his take on the GameStop situation. Um, and, and I liked how he, you know, uh, uh, profiled America Ferreira in that movie. Uh, he's uh, been involved in a number of things in the past year. I liked his Fright Night remake. 
uh, United States of Terra. He directed six episodes of that. Lars and the Real Girl, with, which I thought was a really interesting film uh, there as well. And then uh, the less said about Mr. Woodcock, the better. But hey, you got to start somewhere. So the fact that he was a part of that, I think, is is uh, fantastic and interesting as well. And look, it may be possible that there were other female directors, but either they were busy or they couldn't fit in the time frame that he wanted, that James Gunn wanted this film to be shot. Craig Gillespie with a great history of bringing out fantastic performances from his female cast, uh, both lead and supporting, I think spoke volumes for him. Plus, I'm going to play you something. Uh, my friend Nestor from Nestor Cine, uh, Nestor Cine had a chance to interview Craig about uh, being a part of a superhero universe. And this was very recent. Uh, so I want to play it for you guys and see what you think, Shannon. Here. That's a geek. So let me let me let me uh, wind this up here. And he gave me permission to play this because he sent this to me. And it's an interesting comments from Craig overall. Let's see what you think, Shannon. As a geek, I I see your filmography, and I think that you will be a great fit for superhero movies in particular. Is that something that you're open to exploring in the future? That genre yes. in particular, because when it comes to female-driven stories, there is a Supergirl kind of dark fantasy movie in the in the work as well are you are you open to that absolutely it's but interestingly it's like you know very like uh very much more there is a darker side obviously to uh to some of the the stuff that i'm attracted to and you know particularly like the, with the warner brothers work that's going on with the joker and the penguin and i like that i like these superhero villains that are based in reality that have their you know, like human foils and uh I'm more attracted to that kind of uh, that kind of genre with it, but I would love to be diving into something like that down the line. So, yeah, so that was the last question he asked him. So, so there it is. Uh, clearly, Shannon, he had maybe been already thinking about it, or and some people have speculated, and I know Jeff Snyder yesterday at Hot Mike said, "No, that's not true." But I mean, was he maybe low key involved in the process of selecting Millie Alcock to be Supergirl? Because he was one of probably the main contenders to be in, to be point uh, uh, talked to about directing this movie. What do you think when you hear these comments that I just played for you, and that he got this job, and he mentioned, and he even gets asked about Supergirl in this interview? I mean, my guess is no, that he was not a part of that process. Again, you know, you look at when the Millie Alcock announcement was made, yeah. and you know, his involvement is not definite yet as you already right, said right. like he's he, in talks he, yeah, yeah. he's in talks to do this and you know things aren't happening and then we're hearing about them the next day typically these things are going on for a little while so my guess is that he was not involved with it right, right. um but especially because she's it, it's rumored that she's going to appear in superman and james gunn right. not only being the architect of the dc universe but he's also directing that film like he yeah. he is going to be the guy that makes that makes the decision um but what I thought was interesting was talking about those darker aspects, yeah. those human aspects. Yeah. Um, again, based off of that uh, Tom King run, um, you know, this is a Supergirl who goes to a planet with a red sun, so she can know she can know what it's like to to be drunk. Right. Um, so right. she can go and have this party because, I mean, the 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 Supergirl runs that we've gotten in the past, it's someone who was supposed to be, you know, looking over Clark, yeah. and basically the way that the way she landed versus the way he landed, she's now younger than him. Right. And that's like her life has kind of, uh, her, her responsibility has kind of passed her by. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I thought the, the emotional hook that he liked, even though obviously she is a, she's a Kryptonian on yeah. earth. She has incredible power. She can fly. She has super strength. Um, I think the, 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 uh, emotional stuff, which mm -hmm. I think is, going to be the more interesting the more interesting way into that story the fact that he that's the stuff that he was that he's attracted to that darker side which i mean supergirl definitely does have that darker side to her yeah, yeah I, th I think he's gonna be he's gonna be awesome and when when did that interview take place just a few weeks ago just a few okay. weeks ago so it's okay so he was full on having these conversations yeah, with Warner Brothers. Yeah, okay most likely yes yeah, having those conversations because the tweet is from let me see all right, the tweet is from, uh, oh, sorry, no, this was from October 11th in 2023. So this was, what, six months ago, six, seven months ago that he was asked about this. So a bit of a prescient question from Nestor to ask him this and then to get his response uh, from Craig. And, clear, and, and look, as you said, these things don't happen overnight. It may have been that he was one of these people just quietly having conversations with James Gunn for quite some time before it came time to have talks about 
um, about locking this down because you can talk about stuff for months ahead of time and it's a matter of, well, when the time finally comes to make the decision, okay, now let's get into negotiations. It doesn't mean you're going to get the job. Just because you've been talking with the people for a few months, it all depends on your uh, agents, all depends on what they're offering you, it depends on if it works for you, the scheduling, all of that stuff. So he very well might have been uh, in the process for a bit of time before, but you're right, the darker aspects of it all, it makes me think that this is going to be an even more interesting Supergirl than we would have thought. And with Millie Alcock, who we've seen in House of Dragon, play these darker roles, darker edges, and darker layers in the roles, I think it's going to be a great combination to see. But as you said, now, how many people wanted a female director? And so it's, uh, but I haven't seen the backlash on this one. And I think it's because he's gotten some great performances from female actresses and people are just kind of like, okay, I, I wanted a female director, but I kind of like this guy. So I'm not going to get too upset about it. It seems like that to me. Shane. I don't know. Am I off? Yeah. That? I mean, that was the thing. It's like, I hadn't read anything about it, yeah. um, but, but I was curious, uh, you know, amongst the fan base, if, if there had been any chat, mm. had been any chatter about that. But again, you mentioned yeah. already Pam and Tommy Lee, I, Tanya, Cruella, yeah. Like he he has a history of 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 bringing out a fantastic performance with a with a female protagonist. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. And if any, any of you all who are watching us and our female fans who maybe have an issue with this, let us know what you thought about it in the comment section uh, uh, as you listen to this section of the of the show here. Uh, all right, let's move on to the second part here. Um, uh, speaking of female uh, actresses in superhero films, here, uh, um, Shannon. Let's move on to Julia Gardner. Julia Garner, uh, the sources tell Deadline that uh, Emmy winner Julia Garner here is set to play Silver Surfer in the new Fantastic Four movie. She'll be joining, of course, Pedro Pascal, Vanessa Kirby, Joseph Quinn, and Evan Moss Backrock in this under Matt Shackman's direction. Uh, the production is supposed to begin this summer. A film is set to be out in July of 2025. Um, she has well, she's landed multiple Emmy nominations. She's won three emmys for the love of god uh and she's got a number of films coming out here soon after royal hotel which came out already a few months ago she's got wolfman coming out and then she has the paramount thriller apartment 7a shannon this got the predictable predictable amount of backlash from people so first they they were like don't you dare gender swap and make norn rat a woman great we're not going to do that we're going to find another silver surfer and we're going to make her a woman. But she is connected to Norn Rad. She's Norn Rad's lover. Uh, Galactus is involved in this. The Fantastic Four is involved in this story. And she does become the Silver Surfer. So, Shannon, what are your thoughts on the casting? And what are your thoughts on the controversy, the ensuing controversy? And do you think she's going to work and the story of Shalabala is going to work here in a Fantastic Four movie? I mean, in, ter in terms of making the Silver Surfer uh, Shalabal, no issue with that at all. I'm mm. like, yeah, <laughs> more than likely, uh, you know, the MCU's plans for the Fantastic Four, they're not one movie. They're, they're yeah. going to go they're going to go on for a while and to say that she's going to be the last Silver Surfer again, I think is inaccurate. I mean, I think I think uh, Kevin Feige and the MCU and the MCU uh, uh, creative folks know that fans do really like nor and rad like they, yeah. they do want to see that character at some point and i think we will see that character at some point so the fact that they're starting this off with shalabal not an issue at all yeah. um in fact i think it's actually i think it's a smart choice um in terms of julia garner you know every once in a while there are these performers that get sort of this universal acclaim but for whatever yeah. reason they're they're Screen presence, their talent just doesn't resonate with someone, and and I'm just not a big Julia Garner fan. Um, like based off of Ozark, I found that character pretty grating. Which again, you you don't put everything on the performer. The performer is uh, is uh, is a, is a is a component of mm -hmm. that performance. Like you know, you have writers, you have directors. Um, watching her in inventing Anna, that was another one that I'm like, man, I just am not into this. I am just not into this performer. Um, and then throw on the assistant as well. Like I would, that was a film that I was really oh, excited to see. Yeah. Forgot about and, and I'm just like, look, I'm just not a, I'm just not a Julia Garner fan. <laughs> that being said, I'm, I'm certainly excited to see this movie. And yeah. that's not to say that um, mm -hmm. I could watch, her performance in Fantastic Four and be like, well, I clearly, for whatever reason, those earlier roles didn't click with me, but this one is really clicking with me for whatever reason. And yeah. again, that's not to say that I think she is not talented or, or whatever. I'm just like, eh, you know, it's, it's like, it's like a sandwich. Like sometimes like, no, I don't want, I don't want this topping on my sandwich. <laughs> um, I, I was a little more interested when it was going to be Anya Taylor-Joy. 
Yeah, um, sure. Because she is a performer that I do really, really like. All of her performances I thought have been fantastic. Yeah. Um, but Julia Garner is who they're going with. So yeah. it's just sort of like, all right, we'll wait and see. 2026. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, right, exactly. It's going to be a bit uh, before that thing comes out. And But I, I like the choice as well. She's a strong actress. I mean, and look at all the people they've cast in the film. Uh, there's a lot of strong Emmy winning award nominated actors who are coming in to play these roles. This is the Marvel fucking blueprints, right? They want to bring in people who've got a lot of experience who are recognized by their peers for their work with awards so they can lock down these iconic roles and uh, give them some foundation, a strong foundation to bounce up off of. And I saw people getting upset. Like I, I posted about this and a lot of people got upset. A lot of the, right-wing youtubers got so upset about it and the anti-woke people got upset about it but there's no satisfying them right and they're like well marvel did this and marvel's done this and marvel's done that and it's like i'm like let's just wait and see where they're going with this and let's see how it works uh and uh, but the curious part of this though uh, um, shannon because a lot of people wanted norn rad and all of a sudden there's norn rad fans out of nowhere with <laughs> apparently counting the millions um you know uh, never mind there's never been a silver surfer standalone movie so whatever but the Lakeith Stanfield tweeted something and then took it down. He said, quote, thought it was going to be me. And then went back and forth with some people who are making comments about it and then took the whole post down. So I need to hear what your speculation might be on this. Do you think that he is going to be another silver surfer in the Marvel universe? Do you think he's Norrin rad? Do you think maybe that uh, he was being playful or do you think that this is a legitimate complaint? I mean, because I don't think this is the way Feige would have wanted people to know Lakeith Stanfield is going to be a silver surfer in the Marvel Universe. So what's your speculation on why he would tweet that and then take it down? Wow. I mean, that's that's really, really surprising. Did, oh, you, I mean, hadn't did you, you hadn't heard. What, I hadn't, I hadn't oh, heard wow. of this. Okay. Was, yeah. the, was the tweet connected to her announcement? Yes. Was it, yeah, wow. It was to her announcement. I'm going to go with he was being playful. Um, okay. Okay. That's what I'm going to go with because looking at the career of uh, Lakeith Stanfeld and um, you know, you have to give his, his reps some credit there as well. Sure. Um, he, he seems to be a pretty savvy guy and yeah. I don't think he is the type at this point, And I could be wrong. Um, obviously I don't, I don't know him personally. Um, right. I, I don't think he's the type that would air out dirty laundry online. Yeah. Um, now, now there have been performers who have done this in the past and it's been a little surprising. Like, Oh, I really didn't think you were going to say, I didn't think you were going to say the quiet part out loud. Um, <laughs> but in terms of him playing, um, yeah. Norn rad, I'm like, man, that would be awesome. I mean, Lickie Stanfeld is a, is a, is a performer, is an actor that has been the, the, uh, uh, uh source of rumors in the past. Like yes. people have talked about him possibly p playing Dr. Doom and like whether or not these rumors had any credence, that's another question. Right. Um, right. but he is an actor that audiences do resonate with. So it yeah. would, it would not be a shock if, uh, if, uh, Feige and company wanted him involved in some capacity, him playing the silver surfer to me, that is fantastic casting. I think that yeah. sounds that sounds like a home run. But I'm also thinking about like when Josh Gad was po posting, you know, those photos of the penguin. Like, God, Josh again, Gad. whether or not those conversations actually happened or if he was just trying to drum up, he was having fun or he was just trying to drum up a little interest. I mean, you know, Simu Liu, he was not a he was oh, not a star when he 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 tweeted that that Shang-Chi tweet right. way back when. Um but no, my guess is that Lakey Stanfield was probably having a little bit of fun, but ha but not having read the back and forth that followed yeah. it, I can't yeah. say for sure. Yeah, it's it's quizzical because I I don't understand why you would do this. Uh, you know why you would make this decision? Like, what is the logic here? Where are you going with this? And what will what will the ultimately be the end goal of this? Of you saying this and going back and forth with the fans here. Because it's a terrible way to introduce yourself as possibly Norrin Rad um, in the in the Marvel universe. And I, I, I know Kevin. I have a feeling. I'm gonna say I don't know because I don't know Mr. Feige personally. But I can't imagine Kevin Feige would be like, "Oh yeah, totally, just drop this and, and fuck with the fans to come on top of us announcing Julia Garner here as Silver Surfer." So it's a quizzical decision. On on and then to take it down, it makes it even more quizzical. For me personally, it reminds me a little bit of Rosario when she was posting stuff about Ahsoka initially at the beginning when she was first cast and then took stuff down because people were 
kind of looking at everything and analyzing it. So I don't know. It, it seems odd. And it, and I feel like Lakeith should come out and say something about it and make a statement because people were kind of like going crazy about it. So who knew about it, I should say, because Shannon, clearly you didn't know about it, but who saw my, it? My yeah. guess is that if if he is involved with the MCU in any capacity, mm. that he is not going to say another thing. <laughs> that, would be, that, would, <laughs> that would be my guess. Uh, and again, just because... Feige doesn't want someone to post something or talk yeah. about something. That doesn't mean that they're not going to do it. Yeah, <laughs> look, I mean, point. look at look at Alfred Molina with uh, yeah. No Way Home. I mean, right. that had not right. that had not been confirmed. And he's like, well, I think we can say this. Like, I'm probably not supposed to, but this is like the worst kept secret. And Kevin Feige, who's normally pretty tight lipped about that type of thing, is just kind of <laughs> like, well, now we know we can't trust <laughs> Alfred Molina with the privileged put him, information. Put him in the Tom Holland bucket. Put him in the Tom Holland bucket. We can't trust him. Or Ruffalo. <laughs> as well um anyway all right let's take a well there we go we'll see what happens as you said it's gonna be a while before we see the movie and we'll see her role in it and Shala it's 2025 Ball. i think i said yeah, 2026 yeah. it's 20 yeah. it's next year it's 2025 yeah, next year they're gonna start shooting this year and supposedly we'll have it ready in a year posts production in a i don't i don't know we'll see maybe maybe um right, let's take a quick break shannon and on the other side we'll jump into the air trailers uh right after this are we doing a Superman trailer? <laughs> well, we were talking about Supergirl at first, and then we moved to Fantastic Four, or we moved to Silver uh, Surfer. I was thinking about humming the Beastie Boys Intergalactic. Oh, uh, <laughs> nice. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was going to get there. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, all right. Well, let's get into the trailers, brother man. Uh, where, take us. Where would you like to go? Well, we're starting with trailers, trailers, trailers. We get the second trailer um, for a film that's coming out in just a couple of weeks. This is Abigail. So oh. this is from the uh, the directing team known as Radio Silence, but it's Tyler Gillette and Matt Bettinelli op open. Um, these are also the guys that directed uh, Scream 5, Scream 6, and one of my favorite movies of the year that it came out, um, Ready or Not. So, you know, the, the first trailer really kind of laid out what this movie is going to be. Yeah. We have a group of kidnappers who kidnap the daughter of a powerful underworld figure and keep her in a house for 24 hours. And they find out within that 24 hours that that daughter uh, is a little vampire ballerina. And suddenly <laughs> they're, they are not the uh, they are not the hunters. They are the hunted. Um, the second trailer is really just kind of really doubling down on the horror aspect. That first one, one of the things yeah. with Ready or Not is it is really, really funny. And the, fir the first trailer for Abigail definitely leaned into that comedy as well. Yeah. Um, whereas the second one, you forget that all of that's right. They, they're horror directors. So there are going to be those jump scares. There's going to be that dread. There's going to be that gore. And we'll talk about that a little bit later yeah. in, in the main topic. Yeah. Um, but my guess is that uh, that that this film is hopefully going to be a blast. But yeah, this one definitely leans into the into the more horror, traditional horror aspects of the films. But Johnny, what did you think of our oh, second yeah. look at Abigail? Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if it's going to be good. I don't know what's going to happen. But I like these kind of smaller horror films that have a tongue firmly planted in its cheek, but does not sacrifice the gore and the horror for that humor. So I like that balance here. I enjoyed the uh, ready or not. And um, as we talked about on hot, my guest today, there is a sequel in the works possibly with Samara weaving coming back to be part of it, but not radio silence. And they did uh, the, uh, the last two scream installments, uh, six and seven, uh, which I enjoyed for what they were and they're not great, but I certainly enjoyed them. So I like the radio silence point of view. So I'm excited to see this film and see what they're, uh, what they produce out of this one. Uh, I like the cast for the most part, Got to say, I, you know, whatever people's feelings are about Melissa Barrera and her political stances, I'm not getting that involved with that. I just don't find her that compelling of an actress. And I see these more scenes I see from here, the less interested I am to see her be the lead. And the more I want to see more with the little girl uh, or maybe Catherine Newton or even Dan Stevens, who I thought was the best part of a Godzilla X Kong uh, the new empire, which I saw over the weekend and kind of stupidly enjoyed. Um, so I, I like the cast, um, a bunch of character actors, uh, along with Dan Stevens. And so I want to see how this all plays out. But as you said, the imagery and the gore and the horror in this trailer makes me be, makes me be like, Oh man, this is going to be a blast. And I'm probably going to 
you know, make this movement a number of times while I'm watching the movie, but still hopefully enjoy this thing. And I think I have a screening for it next week. So I'm looking forward Ooh. to it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, Ready or Not was, I mean, again, it was such a unique premise. Yeah. And, and a premise that we don't really find out, we don't get the whole picture until about halfway through the movie. Hmm. And the the feeling that I'm get that I'm getting is that that's going to be the same with this one as well. As you said, I really like the cast, like Catherine Newton. I was not a huge fan of her in Quantumania. Um, but with this one, based off of the things that I've seen, mm-hmm. I'm like, this is your sweet spot. This is yeah, like, like yeah. let you let her be funny because she is funny. Um, Kevin Duran coming, you know, coming in, Dan Stevens, as oh, you Kevin. already said, yeah. Giancarlo uh, Esposito. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this is probably going to be a blast. And those directors who I did see at a panel, they talked about the young actress, uh, Alicia Weir, who Ooh. is Irish because they shot it in Ireland. Um, yeah. They're like, you know, we couldn't we couldn't have made this movie without her. And so oh. it's it's I'm I'm very very much looking forward to it. I hope you're looking forward to it too because it's coming I, out April nineteenth. There you go. All right, what's our next one? Our second one is uh, the teaser for Tales of the Empire. So oh. the Tales of the Jedi shorts that came out last year. Um, you know, there's a lot of Star Wars in development. There's a lot of Star Wars announcements, and it's very easy for things to kind of slip through the cracks. So when the first trailer came out for Tales of the Jedi, I was like, what is, oh, these are those shorts that I think I had read about. And it was uh, six shorts, three from the perspective of Ahsoka Tano, three yeah. from the perspective of Count Dooku. And just sort of chronicling, chronicling their journeys as Jedi. And those shorts ended up being some of the most engaging storytelling I've seen. I think we've seen from Star Wars in a while. And there was a rumor that there was going to be a season two. So when this trailer dropped and it's Tales of the Empire, it's like, oh, my gosh, that is that's fantastic. But this one is going to be from the perspective, three from the perspective of Barris Afi and three from Morgan Elsbeth. Morgan Elsbeth, I thought that was a really, really interesting choice. Like this is a character who you know was obviously in the the entire season of Ahsoka yeah. but she was only in one episode of the second season of The Mandalorian yeah. and knowing that she is a night sister um it, I just thought using her I thought was really really interesting and then you know we see what, like you know she has some interaction with a younger Thrawn mm-hmm. um it's going to be I, I'm very curious as to why they chose her mm. and Barris Offy, like everyone knows from the clone wars, this is the, a Jedi that went bad. Yeah. And now we get to see um, how, how that going bad went. Like we have Jason Isaacs re- returning as the grand inquisitor. Um, and we get a shot at the end of uh, her, her, her new master, which would be Lord Darth Vader. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the trailer for this, I just thought it was super, super unique. I, I love the fact that the title card came up and it said, Tales of the Jedi and the word Jedi burned out as <laughs> Empire took over. I was like, that's just, that speaks to a certain type of fan. And yeah. I think I am very much in that camp. But Johnny, what did you think of our first look at Tales of the Empire? Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Look, I mean, one of the joys of being a Star Wars fan is secretly loving the Empire or sometimes not secret, not so secretly loving the Empire, like overtly loving the Empire stories. They are compelling, right? You have to wonder how people fell to the dark side. Being good is so natural. It seems to be something you want to believe is natural and where you're supposed to go. So when people go bad, you want to explore why. Like, where was the moment? What was the inciting incident? What happened here? And to see it as a progression, I think, is going to be real interesting with the Barris Offy story. And the way they lay it out in the trailer here, she is, you know, she doesn't say much. So uh, if at anything, and she's just kind of figuring this out as it goes along and seeing where she's at with the Inquisitor and then leading to that moment at the end when she's essentially kneeling to Vader. So this is a freedom fighter who has been turned, right? A freedom fighter who was against this thing that she was trying to destroy and now she's going to be a part of this thing that she wanted to destroy. And we've seen that in our lives, haven't we? We've seen people who have been so adamant against a certain movement, a certain approach, a certain point of view not get what they want or go or not believe that the people on their side are militant enough to destroy the other side and then they join the other side and you're like wait what so it is 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 something that we've seen in our lives and certainly people who are old enough to remember 
uh, flower power children who were all about peace and love becoming these people who were recruited to be part of domestic terrorist organizations in the 1970s. So it's not out of the realm of the possibility of Star Wars that this would happen within them because it's influenced by a lot of what we saw originally in the 70s and what Lucas did in the 1970s with the with the franchise. So I liked that that element is here. And then you go, as you said, Morgan Elsbeth. I thought that was really cool to see her with a younger Thrawn, you know, and we see them, I think we see them end up on Dathomir by the end of the trailer. And then we see a shot of her on that planet from the Mandalorian that she was in charge of when she confronted Ahsoka there. So clearly that's early on in her coming in when she says, well, there's a price for being a part of the Empire. But then I think we see her fighting, is it at her fighting General Grievous? I think that's mm -hmm. her. So it's like, well, what happened here, right? So there's a lot here that I think that is there to pull. And, and again, I, God, I feel like a terrible person to say this, but I like Diana Lee in Asanto more when she voices over the character than when she's on camera playing the character. So for me, I thought she was excellent here voicing over Morgan Ellsworth. And I thought the animation, Shannon, was really good for her. So I just was blown away by this entire uh, trailer and the vibe of it. And I'm looking forward to because I love Tales of the Jedi. So I'm very much looking forward to this one. Yeah, and this one comes out on May the 4th on Star Wars Day in just a few weeks here. And that brings us to our last trailer. This is for a Netflix series called Bobkin. So this one stars uh, Will Forte as a true crime podcaster with him and two, two locals. They go to a small Irish town to investigate a, uh, a cold case of three three folks disappearing about 20 years before and they find out that that cold case might not actually be so cold after all you know the whole true crime podcast that's that's been a big thing for the last few years and now we're starting to see a uh, television series about true crime podcasting <laughs> um you know they, they did that recently with based on a true story on peacock with uh yeah. kayla cuoco and chris messina um and this one looks this one looks like it's just going to be hopefully a lot of fun yeah, because you have that um, Will Forte fish out of water um, with the Irish sensibility, not just from the folks that are maybe f a little bit more from the cities, but also this rural Irish sensibility. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. This one looks like it's just going to be super, super entertaining. And knowing what an Anglophile you are, <laughs> I'm guessing that this is right up your alley. But what did you think of yeah. our first look at Bodkin, John? Yeah, I mean, what an interesting decision for Will Forte. <laughs> like, what an unusual combination of people, of course, taking advantage of the fact that everyone's starting a podcast now, and the true crime, true crime podcasts are really a massive industry now with people who are doing these things. Of course, only murders in the building, uh, parodying it, but also becoming it within the show. So I liked that this was an approach that they wanted to do. It's an interesting story to tell, and setting it in Ireland. And you, if you've watched a lot of UK stuff as I have, you know all, you recognize all these Irish character actors that are in the show. But I really want to give a shout out to Shavin Cullen. And I hope I'm saying that right. It's probably Shavon. Uh, Shavon. Shavon. Yeah, Shavon Cullen. She is great. I've seen her in a number of projects recently, from the long call to Dalgleish to the dry. I've really enjoyed her work uh, overall here. So I'm excited to see her being a part of it. She usually plays these kind of like rigid, um, stick, stick up her butt type of people. And certainly that energy is here in this particular um, uh, trailer. So I like what, what she's bringing to it. I'm not as familiar though with the other actors. I think it's Robin Cara. I Robin think Cara. I, yeah. I think I've seen her in the rising, but that's, but I don't remember her being a bigger, bigger part of that. So I, I don't know why I'm not, registering it quite as strongly but i'm looking forward to seeing the chemistry here with them and the story as it goes along so i just i appreciate it that the netflix thought to put all these people together for a story like this i hope it's good yeah robin carr she is in a an apple plus series called trying oh. that i oh. believe it's fourth season is coming out she's what? she's one of the she's one of the recurring players but she is okay. really really funny so again having her with will forte I think I think there's going to be a, a lot of laughs in this series, and yeah. there's a great shot at the end where I believe it's just Robin Carr and Will Forte, but they're on a tractor going through like this yes. this enormous hayfield, and this older farmer asks them if they like a bit of a party, and they're like, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> and he turns on some disco lights that are on the tractor, and you get this yeah. wide shot of these you know flashing flashing lights with this. Duh, you know, I think it's I think they're playing Disco Inferno. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. but. 
looks super <laughs> funny. And this one is going to be hitting Netflix. I believe it is on May. Yep, May 9th. All right, let me ask you one question before we jump out of here uh, and take a break before we jump into our main topic here. Did you get, uh, Lily and I last night watched the trailer for Ripley. The series is out now on Netflix. Have you seen this trailer? Do you have any interest in seeing uh, this uh, this series that is out? Uh, in, it's all in black and white, telling essentially the Tom Ripley story. For some of you may remember the talented Mr. Ripley that Matt Damon and Jude Law and Gwyneth Paltrow were in. Essentially telling the fuller story here with him, with, um, oh God, what's the actor's name? Adam? It's Andrew, Andrew Scott. Sorry, Andrew Scott. I get Adam Scott and Andrew Scott mixed up. But yes, Andrew Scott playing the role here of Ripley. Did you see the trailer? Are you interested in this series at all? Absolutely. Okay. Um, the the film, when it came out 20 plus years ago with Matt Damon and Jude Law and Gwyneth Paltrow, th like that is a beautiful film to watch. Yeah. Um, in terms of pacing, I thought it was really, really slow it is slow yeah i mean you get to some great moments i mean everything with philip seymour hoffman is fantastic oh, my, yeah. um watching the trailer for the andrew scott version putting it in that black and white getting like that slightly more noir feel and matt damon was excellent in the role but i think <laughs> andrew scott is going to bring a more malevolent approach yeah yeah <laughs> and i might be wrong maybe he's going to be Fresh as a daisy and all smiles. No, from the trailer. <laughs> from the trailer. But, but my guess is that we're gonna see we're gonna see shades of Moriarty from yeah. Sherlock. Um, and, and that's not to whittle his career down to one particular role, but right. the black and white, the Italian landscape, looking at him, like you know this guy who is a, he's he's a master con artist. Yeah. Um, and and if you know the story, you know that he takes he takes a step forward on the morality scale that he's not able to walk back. Right. Um, and Andrew Scott seems like he's probably, he just seems like a better fit for that role than Damon probably was. Yeah. I like, again, saw the trailer last night. I'm like, okay, I want to see this. So yeah, I, I'm very curious uh, to see once we finish the 100, the second season of that physical 100, I think the Korean uh, uh, reality workout show, we're going <laughs> to, I love that show. The physical 100. <laughs> If you're not watching the physical 100, it's a fucking awesome show. It's an awesome <laughs> show. Compe competition. People, I mean, these people are in phenomenal shape being told to do incredible challenges to whittle it down to one person. Uh, so uh, I love the first season, been enjoying the second season. So can't wait to jump into Ripley here on Netflix. Um, but there's so much out there right now. Jesus Christ, there's a lot of TV that, uh, and a lot of films about to be out there as well. So this is a good time, folks. Uh, it's revving up here. Uh, all right, let's take a quick break, uh, Shannon. And when we come back, we'll uh, hear from you about WonderCon right after this. Oh, boy. If I'd, if I'd done my research, I'd be humming a Stevie Wonder song right now. <laughs> you don't know her? Uh, not off the top of my head. I'm not good in the clutch. <laughs> As a performer, I think you're good in the clutch. But I think maybe calling upon music, maybe not the biggest. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Mr. McClung, you were able to go to WonderCon this past, uh, uh, what, a uh, couple of days, a couple weeks ago. Or last week weekend. Ago, last weekend. You saw a bunch of our friends there, like Michael Andrew Baker. You also hung out with Mike Kalinowski, friend of the show, Mike Kalinowski. You guys love Kalinowski. So, uh, what was your experience here at uh, WonderCon? What can you talk about? What can you say, by the way? Well, WonderCon is always sort of a great warm up for San Diego Comic Con mm -hmm. because it is a smaller con. The Anaheim Convention Center is a little smaller. It doesn't, not as many big things come to Anaheim as they do to San Diego, but that, that doesn't mean that nothing comes to Anaheim. Uh, Anaheim. Like they did a big Ready Player One panel years ago. Mm that Kalinowski and I were actually there for that. I, I don't remember if Spielberg was there, but they brought out everyone in the cast. Like Ben Mendelsohn was there. Uh, like it, it was, and, and they showed a lot of footage that previously that they, they had not shown. Mm. Um, so this one, this was an interesting year. One, it rained, which. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was raining. I mean, exactly. Southern California, we're getting, we're getting more rain this year than we've gotten in, in a long time. And uh, rain and um, extravagant cosplay don't necessarily go right <laughs> together. So true. <laughs> so true. So you'll see you'll see uh, some great Deadpool's, you know, sporting ponchos. You'll see some some Princess Leia's wearing raincoats. I mean, it, but but the con was actually it was a lot of fun. I mean, Konowski is more of a floor guy. He likes to go out and 
uh, you know, search out uh, you know, rare toys and everything. I'm more of a panel guy. And I went and saw uh, quite a few TV panels with a lot of TV writers, showrunners from uh, stuff like, you know, Quantum Leap and yeah, yeah. the new Law and Order. Um, and they were kind of discussing the state of the industry. And because it is kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird time right now coming off the writers and the actor strike. And it looked like there was possibly going to be another strike. I think that's been averted but they're basically like yeah like this is uh streaming kind of broke <laughs> kind of broke television for a little bit and right now uh the studios are trying to figure out how they can how they can monetize streaming and that's why you're seeing like amazon prime is now you have to pay more not to get ads and amazon right. prime is actually going to be going to the upfronts for the first time um which wow. is that's that's where uh uh advertisers go and see what the what the networks are offering like mm -hmm. where are we going to spend spend our advertising dollars um but the panel that really i was really excited about was colliders directors on directing mm. and this year they had west ball from kingdom of the planet of the apes right uh david leach from the fall guy and mm. they had radio silence there representing abigail and so just getting the, the purpose of the panel really is to kind of spark a conversation between the directors, which is always, always interesting to hear. And because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the big panel at WonderCon, they actually had um, a decent amount, a decent amount of footage. I mean, starting yeah. with Abigail, again, the team from Radio Silence, they went into just um, the actress, Alicia Weir, who they found to play Abigail, young Irish actress, um, who they said, like, if we had not found her, we don't know if this movie would have been made because wow. she was just, he's like, she was so professional. She was so like, just, you know, they, they auditioned her over zoom. I mean, this is, wow. one of the, yeah. I mean, this is the lead of your movie. I mean, you know, it's an ensemble movie, but she, this is the, this is the title character and they had to audition her over zoom. And they're like, you know, as soon as she started, it's like, oh, there's something different about this one. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the footage for this one, I'll try not to be, I'll, I'll try not to get into spoiler territory and just okay. kind of give impressions. Um, but what you, if you saw Ready or Not, and you saw the amount of blood that was used in the third act of that movie, yeah. it seems like Abigail is going further. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I mean, it is going to be it is going to be a gory, bloody affair. Wow. Um, they did talk about the amount of blood that they used and that it was, you know, it, it you know, it's a uh, corn syrup based and it probably could have fed could have fed a small town um, in terms of pancake toppings. Mm. Um, but it just looks like it's going to be like if you are squeamish, this is probably not going to be the movie for you. Um, but this is just going to be a bloody and hopefully hilariously good time. We basically get our crew um, understanding the predicament that they are in. We've seen this moment in the trailers where the house suddenly goes into lockdown mode and the kidnappers realize they're the ones that are trapped in there <laughs> with this little feral vampire yeah. ballerina. Um, more great visuals of her in her blood-soaked tutu just kind of smiling at them again, acknowledging the fact like, yeah, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you kidnapped the wrong kid. Um, but yeah, I mean, this one, I, again, I don't want to go into too, yeah. spoilery, too spoilery of territory, but um, listening to them talk about, talk about their process. Um, you know, you can tell these are, these are guys that were just raised on, raised on horror movies. I mean, and both too sweet, like seem like really, really sweet kind of soft spoken guys that, you know, uh, <laughs> that are able to uh, excavate the darker, <laughs> darker corners <laughs> of our personalities. But again, it just looks like it's going to be it's going to be very bloody, but it looks like it is going to be a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, the next one was the fall guy. Oh, yeah. And so this was David Leach. And, you know, this is, you know, he directed uh, Bullet Train, Deadpool 2. This one um, like we know it's going to be funny. Like we're, we're hoping it's going to be funny just from the chemistry that Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt have not just in the promotional materials, not just in the trailers, but you saw them present, uh, present yeah. an award at the Oscars and you got to hear them trade some shots about Oppenheimer and Barbie, which one was actually the better movie and you know, whatnot. Um, so unfortunately the, the footage that they showed, they were not together. <laughs> oh, and all in the footage. 
Nope. They, oh. it, was, it was an intercut sequence. Um, and you okay. have Emily Blunt kind of doing her thing, right. which, you know, she she's actually it's a it's a scene that was uh, 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 shown in the trailer, um, right. but her at a karaoke party. And uh, she also was one of the voices in the My Little Pony movie that Mr. Vogel wrote yes. several yeah. years ago. Um, and she had to sing in that one, too. But she actually does have a really, really incredible voice. Um, but the Gosling side is a big action sequence. And again, you get to see um, I, I don't I haven't always gotten on with David Leach's comedic sensibilities. I think he gets right. there some of the time. Other times I'm like, ah, there's just there's just something missing. Um, but in terms of action, he always delivers. And right. The scene that they showed is Gosling taking on uh, fighting the uh, uh, red bearded Aussie that we've henchmen that oh. we've seen in the trailer. It's like they're basically I mean, they've shown a little bit of it in the trailer, but they're basically in like this. It almost looks like a uh, like like a like a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um kind of like a bin like it's giant <laughs> iron bin that's being dragged. So you're you're having them fighting on. um like a container, uh, like a ship. Yeah, container? yeah, yeah. Like kind of like a smaller, like a, like a smaller shipping container. Right. But they're they're having this fight back and forth as it's being dragged along. I think it's I think they're in Sydney, uh, <laughs> along the streets of Sydney. Wow. And again, the the thing that I think will make this, even though it was the action looked awesome, it was filmed great, it's exciting. You're going to be on the edge of your seat. The thing that makes it that really sells it is Ryan Gosling. Um, cause even when he's trading punches and getting kicked in the stomach and getting kicked in the face, he still has this, this, his comedic, uh, it's in, he's in six gear. Like yeah, he yeah, is yeah. just every punch that he throws, every blow that he takes, yeah. there's just it every, it's just loaded with character, which I think why he is one of the more exciting performers mm -hmm. that we have leading films nowadays. For sure. For sure. And um, the last yeah. one, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, this yeah. one is going to terrify you, Johnny. Oh, really? So oh, that's kind of surprising. <laughs> it's it is uh uh it is a the the human girl with our ape hero, who I believe is char the character's name is Noah. Yeah. They have they are being taken to uh an ape stronghold. I don't know if this is the kingdom in the title, but it's definitely an ape stronghold, and it has been kind of fashioned out of a dilapidated uh, like freighter. Wow. So you see this broken down ship that is slowly coming apart. And as our heroes kind of get into, like you hear all of the <laughs> shrieks of these chimps and the sounds are bouncing off these, you know, again, these uh, old, old steel, steel parts of the ship. Yeah. Um, as I was watching, I'm like, oh, John is not going to do well. <laughs> <laughs> knowing oh. his knowing his fear of uh, yeah. of a simian uprising. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, my um, God. OK. But just in terms of scope, in terms of the effects, I mean, they showed this this clip, which is basically just the entrance to this this giant set piece. And right. then they showed the trailer, the new trailer that's out, the, the IMAX trailer, where you just oh, yeah. get to see the level of action and just how far i mean weta weta did the effects yeah so you see just how amazing all of these characters look and uh like i don't know how the movie's going to be but based off of the scope and the visuals i mean the clip that they showed of the three this one was uh yeah. visually the most impressive it just wow. gets you it gets you into that feeling of like all right that right there that is a that is a summer movie Wow, that's exciting! I, I'm because I, I, the hype on that one is very big. I know Jeff on the hot mic a few weeks ago said that he had heard some early test screenings didn't go well, but other people countered that and said that they had heard test screenings went really well. So it's going to be interesting to see what the when this thing comes out, what the feeling is, and and Wes Ball I think is a director that people uh, for the most part don't know yet where he falls. Is he great? Is he an up and comer who's going to knock it out of the park, or is he going to fall short a little bit? So I think a lot of people are looking forward to. And do we need a, a kind of uh, do we need another Apes movie because the last one didn't do so well financially? Is this one going to get um, uh, hooked into the public? We will see. The Fall Guy thing doesn't surprise me. Also, there have been so many great reactions to that. I think it's one of the films they're showing 
at CinemaCon, so you'll see more reactions from that next week when it comes out. But overall, it seems to be something that people are very much looking forward to uh, seeing. And Abigail will find out in a couple weeks. Are there any other highlights from your experience? Like, what did you... A lot. <coughs> I saw a lot of people commenting that WonderCon had kind of lost its uh, magic. It wasn't as dense. It wasn't as populated. It There were some empty areas. What did you sense when you were there at WonderCon and about it overall? And what were your highlights besides the director's panel? Well, I mean... Again, like I don't go to WonderCon every year. Okay. Um, and, and this is the first time I actually stayed over. Like this was this year I went to <laughs> Disney California Adventures Food and Wine Festival by <laughs> myself. So, nice. you know, looking looking like a real winner in their beer garden. <laughs> 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 and I had to go see Soarin' Over California while it's back for a limited time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Patrick Warburg, yeah. Um, but then, yeah, but then I made sure to have dinner with our friend Mike Baker, who, yeah. if you have seen Oppenheimer, he plays one of Oppenheimer's attorneys. He's got a very nice featured role. He did a fantastic job. Um, but then WonderCon, to me, has never been packed. Like, it's okay. always been a kind of not sparsely attended, but, again, being so conditioned with San Diego and yeah, just yeah. The, the, the chaos and the madhouse it can be, to me, I I kind of like WonderCon that you, there is some elbow room, like you don't have to worry about um, standing in a line for an hour and not getting into something. Like right. I was surprised with the uh, with the directors panel because there was a panel before it was a it was a Funko Pop panel. Oh, nice! And Kalinowski and I were te texting because he was on the floor and he's like, maybe I'll come. And I'm looking, I'm like, ah, it's starting to kind of fill up here, man. I thought it was going to be like a uh, San Diego situation where mm. it's like, all right, if you want to see this panel, you're going to have to see the three before it. you're going to need to get in. And when the Funko pop panel ended more than half the hall emptied out, which I was yeah. really, really surprised about. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the weather kind of had a little bit to do with it as yeah, well. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Uh, the, it, the pan rainy. it was raining last weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, even everywhere, like there's a, there's a, when you come out the convention center, there's a Marriott on the right, there's a Hilton yeah. on the left. Um, the, the Marriott area was like kind of flooded. Like mm -hmm. it, it wow. was very difficult to, to get to the convention center. If you didn't go inside and go around, it was very difficult to get there without getting your feet soaked. Yeah. Um, the panel I went to in the morning was that showrunners panel. And they, <laughs> there were a group of them before the, probably about 10 minutes before the panel had started and the hall, it was, it was thin. Um, yeah. And they were all kind of discussing amongst themselves. Like, eh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it looks like the rain is really kind of, right. really kind of hurting our numbers here. Wow. Mark Bernardin was on, was on the panel. Oh, yeah. um, uh, who was super, super entertaining. Wow. Um, but by the end it had, it had started to, to fill up a little bit. So for me, I mean, I kind of like that. It's not a madhouse at okay. WonderCon. Um, but, it, and again, like the only panels I went to were the director's panel and a bunch of TV writer panels. Right. Uh, the okay. night before I went to the Hilton, wondering if it was going to be like a Hilton bar situation in San Diego. And it was, I mean, that bar was, slammed wow. slammed with people like Kalinowski and I walked in and we're like well not going here <laughs> <laughs> turned yeah. around and went someplace else but the the highlight of all conventions for me okay because I'm not a cosplay guy like I right. don't I, I don't have the dedication to you dress up for your true. job already. So why would you need to that's dress true. up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I, cos I cosplay five days a week. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the One of the highlights is always looking at the time and care and Ooh. craft that yeah. is put in to those costumes. Um, because, I mean, Kalinowski, he, you know, he, he, I don't know how many of his, his followers know, but he, he builds costumes. Like yeah. that's yeah. something he does. That's, that's like one of his hobbies. Um, he wore his, I'm sure you remember, he wore his Captain America outfit yes. uh, yeah. a few years ago down in San Diego. But I just yeah. love seeing, I just love seeing the the passion that's involved with putting those costumes together. Because, uh, you know, fandoms, especially if you're basing them off of online, fandoms yeah. can get, you know, can look can look a little, a little toxic, a little, sure. a little unfriendly. Mm. Um I think at a place like WonderCon, you can see the good side of the fandom. You can see just the joy that these people get from from you know putting these costumes together, finding their finding their group, finding their you know kind of found yeah. family. Um, that's the stuff that I love to see at a con. 
I agree with you. The vibe at a con is so great, and there's not a lot of negativity and toxicity when you're in those halls and going into those convention rooms and and, and experiencing because it's about fandom and it's a fun time for sure. But I do want to ask you about one thing because I know we got to wrap up here in about three minutes. But um, Sam Raimi uh, at WonderCon had some comments uh, about um, the possibility of directing Secret Wars, and I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Uh, because he was in the news for this. He was at this panel. Uh, let me see if I've got this right. Yeah, he was attending one, WonderCon, uh, and he was talking about it. He said, I love 90% of the Marvel heroes that I've read in the great Stanley Marvel Universe comic books. Uh, way to play to the crowd. I would love to work with Marvel <laughs> again. They haven't reasonably asked me to. I hope they had a good experience with me. They haven't asked me yet. I hope they do. So a lot of people are taking this as him essentially saying, hire me. I want to direct Avengers Secret War. So Real quick, because I know we're running out of time, your thoughts maybe in 60 seconds on this idea, this possibility, what he said. Uh, based off of his work in Multiverse of Madness, yeah. which I was not a fan of, um, I am not, I would not be a big supporter of his directing that film. Okay. Um, now, now, there are some folks out there that actually absolutely love Multiverse of Madness, and they're like, absolutely get Sam Raimi on. Um, and yeah. I think to place all the blame for Multiverse of Madness at Raimi's feet is a little unfair. Okay. Um, you, you know, he's talked about the fact that, you know, he he hadn't watched all of one of WandaVision and um, didn't didn't know everything that had transpired. Right. Um, and while that is a ding on him, it's a ding on Marvel as well. Like if, if this point. guy is not sufficiently prepared that apparently that information was not communicated as strongly as it should have been. Yeah. Um, because again, movies are, are not made by one person. Movies yeah. are, are very much, especially at the Marvel level, they are made by committee. Yeah. And so there, someone, th there were several balls dropped in the process. Um, knowing what a unique style Raimi has. Um, again, I don't think that fits. I don't think that fits with an Avengers movie. I think the Russo brothers kind of dialed into what an Avengers movie needs to be. It's kind of like, do you want James, would you want James Gunn to direct an Avengers movie? My guess would be no, based right. off of what he established in Guardians. Um, yeah. But again, maybe Superman Legacy is going to come out and be like, nope, James Gunn was the guy. It was James Gunn all along. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> on its surface, not a fan, uh, but he has certainly made some entertaining movies in the past. So if that is the way they decide to go, we'll just cross our fingers and hope it turns out well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you can't deny the film made, what, $975 million. So clearly a lot of people enjoy the aesthetic of Sam Raimi, even if some people creatively didn't like the movie, like you, like most of us, on, like all of us on the Geek Buddies didn't. Uh, in the end, it you got to look at the dollars and cents and you got to look at the reaction from the fans. And if it's overwhelmingly positive, it seems to be that he would be in the mix to take this over plus after all these taking a chance on the younger directors younger writers and having it, uh, a lot of these missteps and fumbles over the last couple of years bringing someone who's got a steady hand who's been doing it for a few decades might not be a bad idea but we will see in the end what what they end up doing here uh all right well that's our uh episode this week of the geek buddies thank you all so much for joining us we appreciate it madly shannon what do we have to tell them yeah, I'd like to follow us on social media. On Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies. On Instagram, at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media, on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung. On Instagram, at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you'd like to follow Mr. Roca and ask him where he got that Macho Man shirt, you can follow him <laughs> at the Roca Says. Yes. If you'd like to follow the apps at Mr. Vogel and ask him where he got those PJs, it's at MK Tune. <laughs> Yes, right. And you can follow us on Twitter at geek underscore uh, buddies or on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies there. Follow us there. And also um, also uh, look out for all the stuff we got coming up here in the next few weeks. Everything's ramping up. So please uh, get on board and subscribe to the podcast. That's a really big deal. We've got some great people involved with the podcast. Regal Unlimited is now going to be a sponsor of the Geek Buddy. So please take advantage of all the stuff that they've got coming out. Marquee TV is another client of ours. We're going to record some uh, ads for them. They are sponsoring us here. So please patronize the, the sponsors of the show as well as patronizing the show. That would mean a lot for us there. All right, please subscribe to the channel down below. Hit that bell button. Leave your comments. And if you want to send a special thanks, hit that special thanks and send your support. And we'll talk to you next time. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode here of The Geek Buddies.